what hour your clock strikes here it's always halloween and i'm always your haunted host luce tomlin brenner today is a very special interview episode focusing on clark silva a legend of sleepy hollow expert and the curator behind legend 200 Years of Sleepy Hollow. This was an incredible art exhibit that was really big here in Southern California. And I want to shout out the Lanterns who brought this to my attention last Halloween, the uh, 2020 calendar Halloween season. And there is a gorgeous book that has all of the art and some really interesting uh, critical theory essays about the legend of Sleepy Hollow. And I'm going to be sharing pictures of it on Instagram. And Clark and I get into a fascinating conversation about Washington Irving, the history of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, where it comes from, what it means, how it's endured, how it has woven itself into the fabric of Halloween, and what it means to us now, 200 years later, in 2022. We also answer some eek mails from some lanterns who wrote in about Sleepy Hollow. So this is a fantastic conversation to celebrate Washington Irving and Sleepy Hollow this month. If you want to get more Sleepy Hollow, we read it for our book club on Patreon this month. So please check out Our book club, the next meeting is Tuesday, November 29th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's not too late to join us. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is a novella. It's available in audiobook form, so you definitely have time to read it or listen to it before our next meeting. So check it out, patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. This episode and every episode is made possible because of our Patreon ghoul gang. So thank you for producing this episode. And if you want even more Washington Irving, there is two bonus episodes. One inspired Washington Irving's work and one is another short story by Irving that is also available in our bonus episodes this month. So check those out at It's Always Halloween, or excuse me, at patreon.com slash It's Always Halloween, and check out more stuff on our Instagram at It's Always Halloween Podcast. And let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump into this fantastic interview with Clark Silva. I know you guys are going to love it. I am so excited to welcome Clark Silva to It's Always Halloween. Clark is the curator of the incredible art show that was in uh, Southern California last year, Legend, 200 Years of Sleepy Hollow, and he is like a Sleepy Hollow expert, and he is here to share some of his incredible spooky knowledge with us. Welcome, Clark. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me here. I am uh, super excited to be talking about Sleepy Hollow with you tonight. So this is the theme of November for It's Always Halloween. We're reading the book. We're we're watching all the adaptations. And I've just been putting little things on Patreon to get people in the spirit for it. Because The Legend of Sleepy Hollow has been adapted so many times in art and music and television and in film. It's really amazing. I can't think of many other stories aside from maybe A Christmas Carol that have been adapted this many times. Uh, yeah, I mean, they started like, so when it was published, it, that story in the collection that it was part of became the smash hit. And they have been uh, making paintings and etchings and all kinds of stuff uh, since sort of the beginning that uh, it was published. So it was just like, you really have 200 years of stuff to go through, which was quite the task. Oh, I can imagine. Well, I just want to jump right in and and hear about how you did this. So I actually heard about this because of listeners, because of our lanterns last year were like, this show is amazing. And all the SoCal lanterns went and talked about how great it was. And I was 
so crushed because I wasn't able to go, but then I got to, I got the book, which I just <laughs> love. And I find so like visually inspirational, like just looking at any page of this book is like pure Halloween to me. So I just want to hear about how this came to be. It's such an incredible accomplishment. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. This was, I mean, this really was sort of a labor of love when it finally came to pass. Um, so like the genesis of this project was in my master's program at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, we had to do a small show as part of like our capstone project. And I was working on that in like 2019 on a project that was totally different from Sleepy Hollow. Uh, when that project kind of fizzled out, I was sort of like wandering around of like what to do. And then that happened to be, I think fall of 2019. And I've always been a Sleepy Hollow fan, uh, especially the Disney film. Uh, that was yes. kind of one of the scary things that like my parents let me watch growing up. Same Slightly here. scary, spooky. It scared me as a kid though. I remember watching it. It was one of those Halloween specials that was on every year, like the week leading up to Halloween and like ABC would show it. And to me, it signified the time of year. Yeah, we had it on um, VHS. We had Disney kind of in the 80s and 90s, like cut up a bunch of those package films. Uh, yeah. So they, and I didn't know that you know, growing up until much later, but like they took uh, like melody time and make my music and they cut them up into like single VHSs and sold those. So we had the legend of sleepy hollow, like by itself. And, and we oh, would always sort of watch that around episode. Halloween. It was, I, they, it was legend of sleepy hollow. Yeah. So they split Ichabod and Mr. Toad into the wind in the willows and the legend of sleepy hollow. And I think The Legend of Sleepy Hollow VHS also had uh, the Huey, Dewey, and Louie trick-or-treat short with yes. it. Yes. Oh, I love um, that short. That's classic. That's one of my favorites. And Lonesome Ghost is one of my favorites of the old classic Disney short. Um, Wait, I don't know I that other remember. one. I don't oh, know that's the other a, one you just read. Lonesome Ghost, I think, is from the late 20s, early 30s. It's... Um, Mickey, Goofy, and Donald are ghost hunters, and they're called to this house by um, bored ghosts that want to like prank somebody. Uh, it's so on. Funny. It's on Disney Plus, and it's it's really funny. The ghosts get them there. Yeah, so they're kind of. It starts oh. with them being kind of bored in their haunted house, and so they look up this ghost hunting company, and they call them over, and it's Mickey, Goofy, and Donald. Oh my God. I love that. That reminds me of one of my all-time favorite episodes of the X-Files. Did you watch the X-Files ever? I love the X-Files. Uh, okay, that do you know was one Christmas? of the shows. Oh, go ahead. The Christmas episode where the ghosts lull them into the house. Yes. Is this who? It's uh, Lily Tomlin. Lily Tomlin and Ed I Asner, think. I think. And, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That was one of our favorites episodes and we uh when i was first up in college and i was able to go home a lot more that was one of the episodes we watched all the time like around christmas yes and i love it because it harkens back to the victorian storytelling and telling ghost stories around christmas time because it used to be a spooky holiday yeah i know i think people sort of forget like how well i guess like how scary christmas carol is supposed to be Absolutely. Um, and, and even like some of the lines <laughs> in those classic songs, yeah, it's like, oh yeah, I know ghost stories. That's the Christmas tradition. Uh, I feel like we've gotten us off the path, but I we oh. always call Christmas the C word on the podcast, but I do like oh. to remind people that it can be very scary. <laughs> it can. Actually, it, to sort of bring it back, a lot of, we assume that a lot of our Christmas stuff comes from Charles Dickens. Uh, yes. But he copied Washington Irving's Christmas stories. Oh, so there's Irving is like the father of like Halloween and Christmas in a oh, way. That's so interesting because too, I feel like in public consciousness, Charles Dickens is a little more popular in American culture. Even if you just look at what you learn in school, Washington Irving, you know, we would read the legend of sleepy hollow in school, but 
we read way more Dickens work, but Dickens is English. Like he's not even like a American author. And I feel like Washington Irving really was their progenitor of the American fairy tale and like folk tale. And like, we don't study him as much in, in school. And I feel like Dickens rose in, you know what I mean? Like more in our public consciousness somehow. Yeah. There's always this kind of like, it's the same with art too, where a lot of academics sort of put Europe on a pedestal and American yes. art and literature and stuff gets kind of like sidelined. And I think that happened with Irving. Um, he also was more like a short story writer. So he mm-hmm. never wrote any like novels or anything. And I think that was one of those things where, you know, the novel became like the epitome of like high art. And short yeah. stories, and especially Irving's sort of folky short stories, were kind of like poo pooed on by people for a long time. Um, he has a lot of I comedy think, in his stories. Yeah, like he he plays on a lot of tropes. Yeah, and his um, his first published book was a history of New York, which was like a a biting satire of like the Dutch colonists and stuff. And he actually uh-huh. got kind of like pushback from that. They were kind of like, Oh, this is a little too mean. And he was like, oh, okay. So he sort of tempers <laughs> out a little bit. Um, but yeah, he's always been really funny. And I think that's something that people may not know before they go into reading legend of sleepy hollow uh, is how funny it is. Yes, it is a funny story and it's and it's mocking a lot of like the characters and like there's the whole thing is sort of predicated on pranks as well. Yeah, and that's I think people will be surprised is that it's really Ichabod it's really a story of Ichabod, Brom and Katrina. And with yes. the headless horseman as sort of the final prank at the end. Um he weaves kind of like because he is kind of commentating on gothic literature but he's sort of playing it up a little bit where it's kind of like you know silly superstition uh mm-hmm. but it, the heart of it is really you know i told people that the story is more uh john hughes than tim burton when they <laughs> read it uh it's going to be more funny than scary yeah well that's what's really interesting i know we're jumping around a little bit but i do really love the tim burton adaptation but it is very much from Tim Burton's imagination. There's not, it's not very accurate to the, <laughs> oh, uh, no. the story <laughs> or the intention of the story. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, I love that film. Um, it's one of my favorite Tim Burton ones, but it is, I, Heavy I love it. Yes. And he was very much trying to pay tribute to the 50s hammer horror films. Right, um, yes. Way more pit and, in the pendulum than actually Legend of Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> yeah. Lots of blood. Um, and that juxtaposition of like red blood with that like black and white color palette that he likes a lot. Um, but I definitely think like that is a success in how you can like completely change a story and make yes. it something sort of new and exciting in a way that sometimes that doesn't always work out. Yes, I agree, because it is hard to get people into, you know, 18th century short stories uh, many times or 19th century short, short stories. Like the language isn't, it's a little more complicated. You have to read, you have to give yourself more time to sort of read yeah. and translate it. And I think sometimes people are like, oh, this will be fun. And then it's like, I, it is fun, but it is hard. You have to kind of like be ready to understand, like, what does this mean? I should look this up. And like, yeah. why is this funny? This is not what humor is in the 21st yeah, century. Or, why are they spending 10 pages talking about the food that they're eating? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And there's something about Sleepy Hollow that um, is transcendent you know, we have held on to this story for so long and I think it's captured both your and my imagination. And as somebody who 
really dug into this professionally and explored it artistically. I'm curious what it is about Sleepy Hollow that you think has really captured people's imaginations and also like a little bigger than that, like what is it about America that it becomes like, this is so much kind of become like the epitome of an American ghost story. I think for me, and to sort of tie it back to the first question was when I was sort of looking for what I was going to do when that previous project um, fizzled out was uh, I had a print I got from Disneyland of the Headless Horseman chasing Ichabod. And a friend was over and he was looking at it and he was like, you know, Sleepy Hollow always makes me think of like being a kid at Halloween. Like it's yes. like I just like it's just child American Americana Halloween. And I was like, well, that's, yes. that's cool. That's really interesting. I feel kind of the same way, too. And so that started this like, well, you know, that feeling of connected to a story is something I wanted to explore. And so that was kind of like the genesis for this uh, exhibition when I started to do some kind of historical research on it, uh, I found that something that I didn't even think about was, and it was just one sentence in um, this history book I was reading where the author said that, oh, it was talking about the Disney film. It was an anachronism that the Headless Horseman throws a flaming jack-o'-lantern because the yes. Dutch didn't celebrate Halloween. So, yeah, exactly. And, then, and I was like, I had not thought about that at all. And so that was the spark where I was like, well, that's, that's the story then. That's what the exhibition is about. It's about tracing the story from Irving and the ghost story and the folk tale to Headless Horseman as like a Halloween icon. And how do we get there? Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's so popular, I think, is because it's it's a the Disney film, as with Disney for a lot of things, it's how we get introduced to these stories. Um, yeah. And so it always makes people think of being a kid. And I think as well as that, the fact that it, that it is American, you know, it is ours, is part of that popularity. And also the the humor that's in it. And I think a lot of what separates American like art and literature, uh, if you look at like Norman Rockwell or Mark Twain, it's humor. We always yeah. sort of like stuff that's sort of funny. Uh, Americans and I think that's right. We yeah. love the prank people. Yeah. And I think just all these different things, like the old timiness of it, uh, the the fact that it's kind of like uh is it supernatural is it not there's a little mystery to it uh always is sort of intriguing to people so i think it's just uh, a lot of different a lot of different crossroads that come together with this one story yeah i think that's such a great point and i love that you talk about how the way that films have positioned this as a halloween story but um it's not <laughs> Like the Halloween traditions that we see within the films were not actually happening in America at that time. No. And even, um, yeah. So if you were to, you know, mention Halloween to Washington Irving, he'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, cause right. even, cause even Irving himself is before, uh, he passes away kind of like when the Irish immigration is happening. So he exactly. wouldn't have even been, so it's not even like just the Dutch didn't celebrate Halloween but he is an English person or an English American wouldn't have any idea kind of like what Halloween was uh, anyways. So to see, um, to see that change is really interesting. Yeah, it is. It is really interesting. And I think that there are some times when people study, you know, um, literature, sometimes anachronisms like that can really stick in people's craw, but I think when we talk about folklore and that the legend of Sleepy Hollow has really entered folklore um, territory, that this is all part of what's fun about the retelling of stories and the passing down of stories. And that like the fact that it has been embraced by Halloween is it gives it this next interesting cultural aspect to it. It doesn't take away from the story at all. And I don't think, Sometimes I think it's interesting to think about how it's not related historically, but um, 
you know, sometimes people can get so nitpicky and they're like, well, technically none of this should be in here. (laughs) But I think that extra, extra layer of it makes the story more interesting and shows how important it is to the fabric of our culture. Yeah. And that's when I think that's an argument that comes up, uh, kind of a lot with everything, you know, we're in sort of a period of um, continually adapting things. Yes. Um, superheroes, all this kind of stuff. But you do that because these things have like a life to them. You know, there's something about Sleepy Hollow that's been popular for 200 years. So they're always going to find new ways of telling it. Um, you can kind of look at all the films and everything runs from like, Sarah Duvall's like TV movie folk kind of campy thing to Tim Burton to like slasher films to like the Sleepy Hollow TV show, which is kind of like the X-Files with Ichabod Crane. Um, right. So there's something <laughs> there that's got like teeth to it and it means a lot to people. So it's always going to be adapted. And Irving kind of set that up where one of the things I think that stands out to people when they read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is it's structured as a person telling this story to somebody else. So it yes. already has that folk lore life to it. Like he built that into the DNA of the story. That is such a great point, Clark. I love that so much. You're right. It's, it's as if it's saying, this is the first time it's being told and we're encouraging you to retell it and retell it and retell it. Yeah. That's, and I think it's funny cool. too that... So the way the structure is, is, and the exhibition went into this, is that Irving kind of makes clear that the Headless Horseman is Brom Bones. Right. And the book ending of the story between this guy telling Irving, or Irving's character, Jeffrey Chaucer, who's compiling these folk tales into the sketchbook, um, is sort of clearly made to be like Brom is telling Irving this story. Like he's kind of winking at Brom, like, oh yeah, no, I got Ichabod. Like I ran him out of town and stuff. Um, But just that, you know, that framing of is this a true story or not, uh, I think is so uh, wonderful. It's sort of gleefully like prankish. And I think Irving sees that that a lot. Well, and it's um, it's interesting because one of the I do bonus episodes on Patreon, and this month one of the bonus episodes I'm doing is the um, one of his other short stories, The Specter Bridegroom. Have you read that story? I I read it when I um, was kind of going into the exhibition, but I can't recall a lot of it. I know one of the objects I had was this really cool book from the 1860s. That's those two together. Um, oh my God. Director by a groom so and Hollow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, it's, I don't want to give too much away because it hasn't been released yet, but it is going to be released later this month, but it is a funny story and it has a prank in it. And I just, I really, my, my imagination was so captured by it because it's really scary when you're reading it. But then at the end, it's such a laugh and it's sort of like also a romance. And I was really just, just struck by the way he weaved a few different genres together and how he playfully, you know, kind of understood the Gothic tropes and was already twisting them. But this was, you know, 1819 so like very early in gothic literature so i thought it was incredible that like right away this is somebody who like is trying to have a good time with the format (laughs) which i think we don't think of that we don't think of people in the 1800s as having a good time do you know what i mean (laughs) right everyone is so austere and it's kind of funny it's almost a really interesting pairing of like you know mary shelley writes frankenstein which is this serious gothic science fiction horror story and then just you know a couple years later irving's like well isn't this sort of silly kind of stuff there's already there's already people sort of playing with the gothic horror stuff yeah and i just i really like that a lot because we live in a time where we're playing a lot with tropes we hear we see a lot of remakes and a lot of um 
ad- new adaptations of things. And I think people get a little tired and they're like, oh, another adaptation of this, or like, we're really going to tell this story again. But this is a uh, part of the condition of storytelling. This isn't something that's wrong with our current society. We're playing with tropes the way that the classics played with tropes. It's not a lower form of art. It's what art is. <laughs> Yeah, I always sort of, you know, I used to be a little bit kind of like, oh, gosh, another adaptation. But then you think about, well, you know, how many times are or how many different, you know, versions of the Hercules myth are there for King Arthur or things like that. So, you know, people have always been adapting and remaking and retelling. And then you can even look at early Hollywood and there were already like six or seven Frankensteins before the Universal (laughs) one. So, you know. We And, you know, every time you remake something, it's a different group of people, different times, and it's gonna, they're gonna be different films, I think. You can take something something like that. Yes, it says something about the time period you're in, too, and how it, like, reflects uh, upon that current historical moment in a really interesting way. Yeah, like, I uh, just was watching a couple days ago the Cinderella, or Brandy's Cinderella, there's the reunion on Disney Plus. And I'm like, that's a perfect, like, you know, they wanted to redo that for, you know, the 90s. And so it's a very different kind of film from like the animated film or um, even sort of after the, the uh, Kenneth Branagh live action remake. So they're always going to be different. They're always going to be speaking to different audiences. So well, remake away. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially if you have a vision, that alone, a new vision is what makes it fresh and what makes it interesting. And something I do love about the Tim Burton film is that was originally written by someone who wanted to make it a cheap slasher. And it was in 1993 when the original screenwriter started pitching it to Paramount and Paramount picked it up. And it was before Scream had come out and Scream really reignited the interest in slasher films and the horror genre in the 90s. So they, so this guy was pitching it as a cheap slasher and Paramount is like, this is literature. Like, I don't understand. How could we make a horror movie out of literature? Like, they just yeah. like, we haven't gotten there yet. And they put it on the back burner until a another producer years later was like, oh, Tim Burton could maybe do this. But that's after Scream. That's after I Know What You Did Last Summer. And so the horror of Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow exists, yeah, because of his inspiration um, with the Hammer films and his love for Hammer films, but also because of the success of the new prestige horror from, you know, Wes Craven. And I think that's really interesting too, because earlier in the nineties, they just weren't going to make it. They couldn't, they didn't think you could make the legend of sleepy hollow scary in a way anyone would be interested in. Yeah. It would take something like Wes Craven and Tim Burton to breathe new life into it. And, you know, you say that I'm sort of thinking about the Tim Burton film, like, yeah, it is kind of like a slasher almost. Yeah, there's where like, the mystery, the mystery killer and stuff, and like what's happening and the conspiracy and stuff. Absolutely, and one of our uh, when we were screening the adaptation last week, one of our lanterns was keeping track of the kills, and I think we got up to thirteen or fourteen, which is like a high body count for even a horror movie. <laughs> yeah, I, it's definitely the. I definitely think it's the the bloodiest Tim Burton film. Maybe, yeah, tied with uh, Sweeney Todd, which is a lot of. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the story, uh, while it hints at violence, because of course, you know, decapitation is quite violent, but like we don't really see there is no actual violence in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. No, it's very, um, I think Brom sets the schoolhouse on fire, but like not like with kids in it or anything like that. But, um, <laughs> Why don't they ever kill all of these children like in the book? <laughs> Just kill one final blow, all of them. Um, 
But yeah, it's not. It's more, it's very atmospheric. It's very um, pastoral in that he's talking about kind of like the town and the setting and kind of like how Sleepy Hollow is like this world unto itself kind of thing. But there's really, um, yeah, other than him talking about the the Hessian, uh, which he doesn't go into backstory on them. But historically, the Hessians were pretty... Uh, murderous and violent, and they were hired by Great Britain to just wreak havoc during the revolution. So people would have kind of known German. that. Yeah, they, they were, were German. German. A lot of them were German princes. Um, oh, second, third, fourth, fifth born that didn't seek to inherit anything, so they would kind of sell themselves off for war. Um, but audiences would have been familiar with like who these Hessians were even if sort of the story doesn't go into that. Right. What do you think, having worked on the incredible exhibit that you put together, did you come away with when you, you know, you have ideas about creative projects and you're like, I love this. I know a lot about it. And then in my experience, I sometimes come out the other end, like, Oh my God, like I've been through a whirlwind. Was there anything that you learned, like putting this together? Um, and not like, you know, on the production side, I'm sure you learned a lot, but like about sleepy holler, like, did you walk out on the other side of this? Like, wow, I never thought of it like this. Uh, I would love to hear about any, anything that the event taught you. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about recently, I made a point to put it in. I didn't draw a lot of attention to it because I didn't kind of want to make it like a big deal. I'm a big kind of fan of like subtle activism a little bit where you just sort of say things as they are, um, was Washington Irving's, uh, homosexuality. Yes. And rarely talked about uh, rarely talked about, um, it's starting to become more common now as people talk about him more and we're sort of post the, you know, he was just roommate with people <laughs> kind of conversation. Um, and so I wanted to highlight this. So when he's, Irving is like 16, there's a yellow fever outbreak in New York City. And he actually leaves uh, the city into the country to escape it. And that's when he first comes to Sleepy Hollow. Um, and he meets a friend, um, oh, I forget, James Paul, James Paulding. Um, and they're both gay and they're both kind of like, they start this romantic relationship and it's James who tells Irving about the Hessian myth and like walking through the forest and like, the ghost stories and all those things. And I was thinking about that this year. I was like, wow, like, cause I'm working on this other project on kind of like, uh, queer history. And I was just reflecting on like, wow, like this, you know, icon of Halloween started with two gay men telling ghost stories in the forest. And that was kind of this, you know, like go gays moment for me that, you know, we've been at, you know, queer people have been sort of at the front since the beginning in like American culture. And so there's all these things that a lot of people probably don't, aren't even aware of are, you know, the products of queer people. So that was probably one of the biggest kind of like aha moments from it. Uh, but also just seeing, you know, like when you doing research and you're going, you're kind of like going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. It was amazing to see how much, history and culture changes with just this one story. Like you, you start with Irving and you go through like Irish immigration and Halloween and Disney and all these different things. And it's amazing to see, to really see that thread of historical change happen. Uh, That was just kind of, uh, it's mind blowing when you kind of like are sitting with it for so long. It really is. And I think about that with Halloween a lot. And I've said this on many episodes, and I think it's pertinent to keep reminding people that Halloween is a holiday that was almost squashed multiple times because of ethnocentrism and classism. And especially when it came to America, the Europeans 
who had come not that long before the uh, Irish immigrants hated the Irish so much and hated their celebrations and thought that they were loud and crass and obnoxious and they were sick of wagons ending up on the top of their homes. Yeah. And they wanted to like get rid of Halloween, you know, and the Romans wanted to get rid of Halloween when it was in Europe because they thought that it was witchcraft and that it was against the church. So there's a lot of times and, you know, what's interesting, too, is so much of, you know, I've been studying now for a lot of this year, uh, the history of witchcraft and its connection to Halloween for upcoming episodes and so much of the persecution of witchcraft overlaps with the persecution of Jewish people and the persecution of uh, homosexuals and any kinds of uh, sexual relationships that were considered to be devious in any way. And so much of Halloween is really just like surviving um more like, I don't know, basic culture. Do you know what I mean? Like, like Halloween is a very, um, uh, it's an outsider's holiday and it, it keeps being, it keeps sort of overlapping and dovetailing with these, you know, parts of literature and filmmaking that are also made by outsiders. And I think one of the reasons it keeps surviving is because we're pushing it forward in the face of, um, you know, a culture that really wants to shut down any kind of outsider artistic expression. Definitely. And it's so kind of fascinating to see that history play out. Like you said, like even, um, even when sort of ancient Rome was conquering the Celts, Halloween, Samhain was kind of like this uh, rebellious moment. And Halloween Absolutely. has always had, it's kind of like a holiday of rebelling, which is so yes. interesting. And it seems to always like be that way, which is such a fascinating thing that this one, in all its different like permutations through the years, it always seems to ex totally exist to ruffle the feathers of the status quo from, um, yeah, from the days of like, paganism and witchcraft to like the persecution of immigrants and Jews. Uh, it's so fascinating to see this one kind of holiday span for even now, you know, the way Halloween sort of is sort of like a queer holiday too, that it's always sort of pushing back against forces of oppression. Yes, absolutely. And I was reading an article recently about um, how even the even the like sexification of Halloween and like sexy Halloween costumes comes from drag culture and that it was like originally in the 60s and 70s drag shows where uh, like they would do sexy Halloween shows and that that kind of permeated as those shows became more popular then people started to dress more sensually for Halloween but even that which I think now is such a straight thing you know dressing in like sexy nurse costumes <laughs> sexy hot dogs really yeah it's something that like originates again in gay culture uh which is really fascinating to me and I want to do I really I have a dream of doing an episode about um how like horniness and Halloween like kind of go hand in hand oh, yeah. <laughs> and how to connect with gay culture as well. <laughs> um, so I would love to talk a little bit too just about your passion for Halloween in the incredible book that goes along with your show. Um, you say in your introduction that Halloween has a special place in your memory, and it was and continues to be a holiday of pure magic and festivity. And I just love the way that you said that. And this has come up with many of our lanterns who have contributed and many guests who have talked about this feeling of magic that goes along with the holiday. And I do think that's because it is free from any religious obligation. And I'm kind of interested to hear a little bit more about your love and like, I don't know where you see that like Halloween magic is coming from. Um, I think it is, I'm thinking, um, you know, what you said, and you said this actually at the, uh, the live podcast at Midsummer Stream is that, you know, Halloween is 
you know, its roots are in sort of religious practice, but Halloween itself has become kind of a secular-ish thing in that it is sort of liberated from um, responsibilities that come with even other holidays. Um, I'm a huge Christmas fan too, but, you know, it comes sort of with uh, a lot of baggage, um, family oriented or religious, ho- uh, religious holidays kind of have that. And Halloween like doesn't have that at all. Like it's literally just, um, and it, for a holiday that is so kind of iconographically linked to like death, it's all yes. about like living and it's all about celebrating life. And I think devoid of anything else, um, you know, you celebrate with, you can celebrate with family, you can celebrate with friends, you can celebrate by yourself. Like it's, um, it's a connection to kind of like a sort of spiritual primitive past Mm. without any kind of like, like it's just you and like living and the spirit world. And there isn't anything kind of else like tied to that. And it's that fun and community. Uh, I was thinking about this. We went um, to downtown Orange for on Halloween night because they go all like all the houses go all out. And I was watching all these people and I was like, God, this is just, you know, especially in a digital age to see so many people out and like trick or treating and like engaging with the community and their neighbors and stuff. It's kind of like nothing else kind of brings people together in this way and so i think that you know when you go trick-or-treating as a kid that magic never really like leaves you uh so it always becomes especially now as halloween is definitely becoming more um uh adult but not like adult like mature but like you know there's midsummer scream and there's horror nights and there's you know we saw lots of teens and adults trick-or-treating too so i think it's becoming you know it's not for little kids anymore. Yeah. Um, I that think... makes me so happy. You know, that's my dream. I've been pushing this on the podcast, but I think trick-or-treating should be all ages because I think the more people that you have involved with Halloween and you have out in the community interacting with it, each other, the better it is for our society in general. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, like, we saw there were people, like there was buckets of candy and buckets of beer like, and they're handing out <laughs> beer to adults and stuff, and, like, they're giving candy. That's so um, fun. A lot of the <laughs> houses there are doing, like, barbecues out front. So there's some are people doing food. There was, like, um, one street was blocked off, and there was a cart of, like, a food vendor, like a little taco vendor and stuff there. So I feel like um, it's just that. It's one of probably the last big, at least – out here uh, of these huge community events. Yes. And so I hope that we don't lose that. No, and that's what I want to encourage lanterns all the time that, uh, you know, we have people from all over the world and some are in countries that don't celebrate Halloween really at all. And some people just live in more rural communities. And I always just want to encourage people that even if you don't, we live in, you know, we're very lucky, Clark, to live in Southern California where people really love and cherish Halloween. And there's so many activities here for us starting in July to do to celebrate Halloween. But for all the Landerns who live in places where they don't have as many activities, like you can be that person who starts a new tradition or who becomes the Halloween person on your block. It really just takes one person to get committed. And then that type of enthusiasm, I really believe is infectious. You know, and you never know who's going to join you in the future years. You can be the Halloween change you want to see in the Halloween world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's not even, I mean, there's events of like trunk or treat and like stuff that's not super elaborate or anything that you can just kind of do. Um, you can even do like neighborhood block parties Halloween night and just have people bring yes. food and stuff. So it's not, it's not necessarily like you've got to turn your house into the haunted mansion. Right. To like successfully do Halloween, you can kind of do whatever you're able to do. I totally agree. Um, all right. I wanted to ask you one more question and then I would love to jump into some eek mails because we have lanterns who really want to talk to you about some of their sleepy hollow memories. But oh, I do want lovely. to know lastly about your exhibit, 
what was your favorite or a couple of your favorite pieces that you got to show off? Was there something that you just felt like, oh my God, this is so magical that I get to have this and I'm so proud to have it here? There was, there was a couple. So I'll start with the one that was the most unexpected. Um, and that was the uh, Sleepy Hollow dress, the Tim Burns Sleepy Hollow dress. Uh, that was maybe like a month or two before opening. I saw, um, it was made by a historical costumer, um, Christine Millar. She's, um, Sostein, S-E-W-S-T-I-N-E on Instagram. And she did this amazing photo shoot of the Sleepy Hollow dress. And I was like, I have to have this. Like, I need to show like, um, that like there's people out there making these things, which is important to me sort of as a curator because it says so much about how important many of these pop cultural things are that people are willing to like take the time to like remake these themselves. Absolutely. Uh, and I e- and I emailed her um, like, oh, because I was just intending to use the photo. I was like, can I use the photo for like a panel in this exhibition I'm doing? And she was like, yes, great. That's lovely. Do you want the dress too? And like my jaw dropped and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, please. And she was like, absolutely. So she packed it up and sent it to me. Um, And that kind of became like this show stopping piece. Like we set it up right when you like walked into the gallery space. It was like right there lit. Um, And that was just a pure kind of like circumstance happening uh, that just you know, there was a kind of a lot of that going on with this show too. Uh, but that was just amazing to get that. Um, there was a piece that for me as sort of the history nerd was really interesting was a, it was a porcelain like luminary lamp of the headless horseman. Ooh. But what they copied was an old 1800. Uh, litho print of the horseman who clearly has his head like in a shroud like it's brown bone covered with a normal pumpkin on his lap chasing Ichabod and what this the designers of this piece did and I think the piece itself was from the mid 90s is they removed the head kept the same kind of like structure of the horseman on the horse they removed the head and they carved a little jack-o'-lantern face into the pumpkin resting on his knee. And I was like, well, that's this whole exhibition story in this one little like porcelain uh, decor piece. And I was like, that's just so like, they probably didn't even think about it when they were making this thing. Um, right, but, but that's the whole journey of where the story started and where it is now. <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, oh, this is, I, I found it on eBay, and I was like, ah, this has, I have to have this. This has to be in there. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the early books are really cool. Um, there's a book yeah. from the 1860s um, that is actually the painter, or the, the guy who did the engraving went on to do that famous George Washington crossing the Delaware painting (laughs) um it's the same guy um and i was like well that's really cool that's a great connection to kind of like american history american art history um and really i mean what was amazing too was all of the kind of original art that these artists i asked um to do those were like out of this world amazing and i was so happy that uh they were all able to do it because I started this project in 2020. So the exhibition was supposed to open fall of 2020. Oh. And cause that would have been the 200th anniversary of right. the story. And so they stuck with me through all of the, like the shutdowns and the, Oh, it's happening or no, no, it's not happening now and stuff. Um, and they did just amazing work. And it was such a wonderful like component. And what I loved was how varied the pieces were. Like they all kind of showed how much the story has changed. Cause some people did like folky stuff. Some people did like straight up scary horror things. Uh, and it was just so 
refreshing and amazing to see uh, that like heart of the story of interpretation kind of manifesting itself. Cause I didn't really give them direction. Uh, mm-hmm. I was just like, don't do the Disney version. Um, right, right. No, we don't need any more <laughs> yeah, no copyright. Um, and, and that was it. And they went off in all different kinds of directions. And I just love that. So I think that was one of the highlights of the exhibition for me. Oh, wow. It's so cool to hear that because I'm sure, you know, looking through the book from the exhibition, I mean, each piece is gorgeous. Like everything you had is stunning. So you must have had like, you must have just felt like you had an embarrassment of riches. I did. I, you know, I'm still sort of shocked sometimes when I go through the book or um, I got some of the prints myself when the show opened uh, and just being like, oh, this, like they knocked it out of the park. Like none of them didn't do anything less than like a thousand percent. Um, I was a little sad that um, Megan Melly's piece sold before the show. because I was like, I want that to be mine. <laughs> um, she did the one of the horsemen on the tombstone panel, um, but they were, yeah, no, they were all absolutely incredible. Amazing. Um, well, I want to hop into eek mails. Do you want to, do you want to hear some things from some lanterns? Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. This one, uh, has a subject line, legend of sleepy hollow, and it's uh, short, but sweet. So Ashley writes, I love Washington Irving. I love the legend of Sleepy Hollow. I read it every year and I've taught it to many classes of students. For a school performance, when I was a drama teacher, we did a modern retelling of the story crossed with an urban legend style campy horror flick because my eighth graders that year were really into horror, especially quote old school movies like Scream. (laughs) And I know what you did last summer. (laughs) Wow. Yes, we call our millennial teen movies old school. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, out. (laughs) Anyways, it was a student-led little production and they did such a great job with it. Also, a pride and joy of my book collection is a first edition illustrated Legend of Sleepy Hollow with illustrations on tipped in plates by Arthur Rackham, or maybe it's Rockham, who I'm also obsessed Uh, with. Yeah. Do you know him? Yes, he is a really famous illustrator. Um, He is sort of, yeah. Oh, yes. So I, I um, had to, so that book was in the show as well. Um, and it started off as like a, like a, a 90s reproduction. And I was like, well, that's going to be fine. because I'm not going to find a real one. But then yeah. um, one came online and I was like, I have to have this um, for this, just for the show and for myself. So I got one too. Um, he's probably the next most famous illustrator of Alice in Wonderland stories. Um, oh, after that Camille. makes sense. I can see that. Like, there's little and gremlins then, on the cover here that yeah. just have like such an interesting, um, just a kind of horror vibe. And you're like, well, there aren't really gremlins in the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but okay. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of it's interesting because that sort of shows because the illustration, his illustrations are very kind of spooky too. Yeah. Like there's ones of like witches flying and I think he's more illustrating what Irving is saying about Sleepy Hollow than like what's happening in the story. Like he's more mood painting uh, the narrative. Um, but I would actually say, yeah, Arthur Rackham's illustrations are probably like the classic Sleepy Hollow illustrations. Oh, cool. I can't believe I was not aware of this at all. Um, But I do really like these illustrations. I have to think, you know, in my research, I did not come across this as being an inspiration for Tim Burton at all. But like these pictures of like these little sprites kind of in the tree and how twisty and scary this tree is. It really reminds me of the tree full of heads in Burton's (laughs) Sleepy Hollow. Yeah, Yeah, there is kind of a a Burton-esque 
likeness to Rackham's illustrations. I think he did also like Hans Christian Andersen stories too, and they're all kind of like that period, like late 1800s, early 1900s, a lot of the illustrators, um, Edmund Clark, who did a lot of Poe illustrations, they're all these kind of elaborate, weird, kind of creepy things, which are great. Oh, cool. You know, they also kind of remind me of Hieronymus Bosch. Like yes. The, the ghouls. Forms and stuff, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, this is really neat. Well, Ashley, thank you so much for writing in about this. And I love the way, I love when teachers get really creative with classic stories. Because as I was saying earlier in our conversation, the book is really funny, but it does mean you have to do a little figuring out culturally what things meant and what was funny then and why is it funny now? Like, it's not necessarily going to resonate with teenagers. And I think teachers who are able to find new ways to tell classic stories is how you get kids interested in literature. Yeah, definitely. And something like that where there's such a, uh, like a classic trope kind of at the heart of it, because really it's like, you know, um, the historian... David Skull for the Sleepy Hollow catalog wrote an essay. He's a big universal monster historian. Uh, he was kind of like, oh, this sort of establishes, you know, the cheerleader, the jock, and the nerd trope in like American storytelling. And so oh, you cool. can kind of have that, you can kind of go in all different places with that. Absolutely. I love his book, The Monster Show. Yes. Yeah. I was yeah. super, I just sort of emailed him out of the blue and I was so happy that he was like, oh yeah, I'd love to do that for you. I was like, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, let's take our next eek mail. This one has the subject line, are birds gothic? Which I'm already super into oh, because okay. I love birds. Mm. So, and I love gothic literature. So I'm excited to see what we think about this. Hi, Luce. I recently listened to a reading of Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, and I couldn't help but notice how many bird references there are. Ducks, guinea fowls, woodpeckers, blue jays, pigeons, cedar birds. I could go on and on. <laughs> Katrina is also referred to as a coquette, which can be a type of bird. And then there's Ichabod's last name, Crane. I know a Excuse me. I know the short story uses a lot of descriptions of nature, and it seems Irving is known for his rich and decadent language. But I'm wondering, is this just a literary quirk of his? Were there a lot of birds in New England at the time, or are birds prominently featured in other Gothic works? I wasn't, er, I was also surprised by how much of the short story doesn't talk about the Headless Horseman. To be fair, the 1999 Tim Burton film is the version I'm most familiar with, so maybe I was expecting some more supernatural action from Irving's original story. Nevertheless, it managed, and still manages, to inspire so many iterations over the years. Do you, Luce and Clark, have a favorite Sleepy Hollow adaptation other than the original? Thanks, Diego. Wow, what a great, so many really great um, little tidbits. And he, Diego picked up on so many things there that I find really fascinating. So Clark, what do you think? Do you think birds are gothic? <laughs> I, well, one of my favorite Hitchcock's films is the birds. So I would say definitely. They are Me little, <laughs> I was little creepers. I was Halloween in like 2010. Oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah. Um, I'm not scared by birds. I know a lot of people are. Um, and in terms of like Irving's relationship to them, I think we're, we're dealing with a time period where nature was kind of all around everybody all the time. And, you know, we think of like New York City or Philadelphia as being these big cities now, but they were not big cities back then. Um, right. you had, there were no, you know, you didn't go into a market and buy, you know, packaged chicken, you know, there was a butcher <laughs> with the chickens were everywhere. And so I think he's probably, if you are looking at him as more 
less gothic literature and more folky, I kind of think that he is sort of using kind of a human, the human nature of birds to kind of talk about people. Oh, um, interesting. If you're looking at, you know, Crane and Katrina and the story itself as being more humorous, more John Hughes than Tim Burton, um, I mm-hmm. think there may be a connection there. Uh, but also, you know, if he's, he's drawing on so much of the landscape and the nature around everything um, that it's not surprising that he kind of talks about them a lot. Cause he does. I mean, people might be really surprised, you know, like Diego said, um, if you're, uh, yeah, if, if you're familiar with Tim Burton's <laughs> legend of sleepy hollow, and then you go back and read the book, you're going to be like, there's a lot less dead bodies in this short story than this <laughs> yeah. movie makes it seems, it seems it to be. Um, but I think it's kind of that because I haven't I haven't come across stuff about like Irving and birds, um, but I do know that he was part of that. He was a little bit of a forerunner to the transcendental movement that yes. really like with uh, Louis, Louis May Alcott and them, uh, where nature uh, was really important. And they sort of describe a lot of things through like a natural lens. So that might be more it is that he is just sort of using kind of like the scenery around him to talk about people in the story. Yes, it's really interesting because I feel like it's not quite the Industrial Revolution yet, but there is this anticipation. You know, I feel like they sort of... um, uh, almost predict the Industrial Revolution and like the pains that come from it and the way that it does disconnect people from nature. Um, Transcendentalism, I mean, like it really, um, it's really interesting because I feel like they do uh, write these stories that kind of encourage you to be in touch with nature and how nature is a part of art in a way. Um, And we're not even at the time where machines have really put people out of work yet, but there is an anticipation of that in a lot of their writing, I think. Yeah, and um, Judith Richardson, who's an Irving scholar, she wrote an essay for the catalog too. She talks about that, of kind of the symbolism of Ichabod as a Yankee coming into sort of the Dutch farming community in New York as kind of like, you know, Irving is seeing this kind of commercial expansion in the United States And he sort of juxtaposes the New Englander uh, with the the sort of superstitious Dutch farmers. Mm. There is a little bit of that kind of like, oh, things are changing. Um, And he, you know, nature and the environment of where the town is plays a huge role in the story in how people relate to Ichabod. Um, you know, Irving yeah. talks about like everyone in Sleepy Hollow kind of walks around in a daze and stuff. So he's very much aware of like that the power of the natural world kind of over people. Yes. Yes. And it's interesting too because he's a school teacher and they changed that in Tim Burton's adaptation. He's a detective, which really changes how he's seen by the town. They do still do a good job in Tim Burton's adaptation of people being like, okay, you're a big city man. But yeah. I do feel like that's, that's like an aspect of it in the story too, is like, who is this outsider, this person who thinks he's smarter than the rest of us coming in trying to tell us what's what. Yeah, and he's, it could bother, like there's not really a villain. It's not kind of a good guy, bad guy story. But Ichabod right. is kind of an antagonist in the yeah. story. He does come in. He's an outsider. He's trying to kind of like teach the kids things that the community doesn't want him to teach. He's sort of like a, a gold digger where he's sort yeah. of shacking up with the Dutch wives and stuff. And he's kind of just looking out for free food. Uh, he really is into Katrina because of her father's money. So he's not right. like, he's not really a hero. In a way, um, he is kind of like that, that, uh, it's a term, I guess, that comes later, like after the Civil War, but like the carpetbagger, like the person who's come in to like kind of change things up in the community. 
and make yeah and make money and benefit from things that the community has been doing from a long for a long time and he just kind of yeah. shows up ready to take advantage yeah <laughs> yeah he just sort of shows up um and not that Brom is like a hero but you know Brom sort of takes it on himself to kind of like show this this Yankee what's what so it's interesting because there is also an aspect of the story that's sort of anti-outsiders, which can also be read as anti-immigration, which is kind of interesting. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Um, I think I would almost say it's more, it's not necessarily anti, I wouldn't say anti-immigrant because Ichabod is of sort of the same sort of grouping that Irving is from. Um, I think Irving is more commenting on Americans expanding than he is sort of about immigrants. Um, He's more kind of saying like, look at what us Yankees are doing to these other kind of communities and things like that. Um, Irving was very less uh, sort of, opaque in his criticisms of kind of American society. Um, Mm -hmm. I kind of think that has to do with him being gay. Uh, A lot of, you know, in those closeted times, you probably don't want to attract attention to different things. So he was very privately kind of like uh, pro-Indian rights and anti-slavery, but wasn't very public about it. Uh, I think that the reaction to his first book, um, that got kind of like negative publicity, the history of New York. And the history of New York is pretty, uh, for the time, it's pretty kind of like biting on like the Dutch colonists and stuff and like treatment of Native Americans. Uh, and I think the pushback from that made him more like, oh, I, I can't like ruffle feathers because people, I can't have people like looking too closely. Oh, at interesting. Me. Um, yeah. Wow. What a great point. And so I think he was very, you know, and that's uh, sort of the way it is with kind of a lot of queer people is you don't want too much attention sort of drawn to yourself. So he was very, very uh, particular about sort of the crafted public image of himself. Um, And so, yeah, I would say, you know, it's more if it's if you can kind of read anything into it in that way, I would say it's more sort of. Uh, a critique of Americans, the Yankees, going out into the communities and being like, okay, you're going to do this now, or you're going to do what we say now, kind of a thing. Um, yeah. I really admire that a lot. That's an excellent reading of it. And I think that it's really rare that we see that sort of in popular culture now is like a self-criticism, where it is more like, well, here's how not to act, everybody. I think we see that like more heavy handed messaging in a lot of um, art and popular culture and films now. But to really have that like, hey, I'm also part of the problem is uh, really like rare and commendable to see in art, I think. <laughs> yeah. And Irving spends a lot of time in England. So he kind of has this distance to the United States and he's kind of uh, he's watching stuff happen over there. And then when he comes back yeah. um, in like the 1840s, he goes on this sort of tour of what was the West at the time, which was kind of like Tennessee and stuff. And so he's seeing firsthand mm-hmm. kind of like the removal of Indians. And he spends some time at plantations with slaves. Uh, and I think that's when you kind of see a little bit of like um, him trying to put, his feelings on those things into his stories. Um, there's a short story, the, the devil and Daniel Webster, where the devil tries to tempt Webster with being um, like a slaver and like right. all the wealth and money that you can get from doing that. And Webster's like, no, that, that's, I'm not doing that. Um, so I think Irving is trying to um, toe a line between like, you know, America's favorite author and like maybe expressing himself a little bit more um, that you don't really get until like Mark Twain comes in and is like, Mm. oh, this is wrong. This 
is terrible. Like he's much more like I'm gonna go mm-hmm. straight after like those things. Yeah. Interesting. Oh wow, that's so fascinating. Thank you so much for that additional insight. I really appreciate it. <laughs> It's just really interesting to think about in context, because, again, I do think that there is sort of this thought that all people were pro-slavery or all people were pro uh, the removal of indigenous people, you know, and there is it is interesting to see that, like, no, actually, we're not living during like a, quote, woke time. There's artists and literature and there have always been, you know, art and literature has always been kind of had this place in our society that questions things and pushes back against societal norms and, you know, uh, oppressive forces. And I think it's a great reminder that that's not something that's new. And that's kind of the role of art and literature. Yeah, there's, um, there have always been people like in American history pushing back of many different races, um, and religions and different sort of ethnic backgrounds. And I think, you know, the national narrative moves in one direction and leaves a lot of those people behind for one reason or another. Um, totally. But when you start to go back, you're kind of like, oh, no, people, yeah, they pushed back against these things. Um, yeah. In ways that they could, you know, we could um, critique people for not maybe being as vocal as, we now think that they should um, or they're doing different language, they're using different language or they're doing different things that make sense sort of in that time period that they're doing them in. Um, sure. But there's, yeah, there's been people um, pushing back for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so we got really far. Uh, we discussed a lot related to this eek mail, but let's just real quick <laughs> tell Diego what our favorite Sleepy Hollow adaptation. We talked about it earlier in the show, um, but I think mine is probably the Disney version, just as far as it being the most accurate to the, and the most accurate and the most like Halloweeny vibes to it. I think so. I think I have to agree with that. It is the most, it's the one I try to watch every year. Uh, it's the most, you know, it's nice shorts. You compare it with something else. Uh, it does a great job of, and it is the, in terms of mainstream popular kind of culture stuff, it's the one that tips the scale from folktale to Halloween. Um, and it just has that festive feeling uh, for me, so I have. To, I mean, I love the Tim Burton one. Me too. Um, but it's yeah, that Disney one is just so like it's you know what we said before. It's childhood Halloween. It's you know the ghost story. Uh, it's an amazing like just. I was even when I was doing research uh, and putting the show together, I was watching. Um, you know, I watched that short over and over again. And like the animation is just so good, you know, for being sort of a World War II film, it's so good. Uh, the Headless Horseman is so uh, iconic. It's just like, it just checks off all those little Halloween dots on that list. Yeah, so I do have to say that <laughs> that's the best one. Yeah, I, I agree. And also being the entry point, you know, for kids into classic literature uh, to really like, you know, care about it uh I think that's also what makes it my favorite one is anything that like opened my eyes towards Halloween or towards a beloved what later became a beloved story that's kind of like what makes something my favorite and I do love the Tim Burton version uh we just watched it uh you know for the podcast and it was so fun to watch with so many people who had never seen it before and I do think it pushed I know it's cool, right? It's it was so fun, and there's people who have never seen the Disney version, so I'm excited to show that off as well. Um, but yeah, the uh, one that I used to watch growing up too was the um, Jeff Goldblum. Um, yeah. Jeff Goldblum, yeah. Have you seen that one? Mm-hmm. It's pretty dull, but it's really accurate. Yes, it. Yeah, I saw that. I don't know what. I kind of went through these weird like uh, kicks. So there was like a Jeff Goldblum kick when I was a kid. Uh, so it was like um, the fly Transylvania 
six five thousand and his version of the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And it's a TV movie, so you kind of have to go into it like knowing that. Um, and it is more. I mean, there is this weird thing with this ghost, uh, but it's very like folky. Um, it's fun to see a young Jeff Goldblum. I think is sort of the highlight of that version. Yes, I totally agree. He he really sort of nails uh, Ichabod's look in a way that I don't know if the other adaptations quite get. Yeah, when you're because you're dealing with, I mean, you know, the Disney one is animated, so you can kind of do what you want with that. But I think Jeff Goldblum probably is the way that Ichabod is supposed to look in a way that I yeah. don't think even like Johnny Depp or um, I forget his name, but the actor from the the TV show, the X Files Sleepy Hollow TV show. Right, um, they're a little too pretty. I feel yeah. like. <laughs> They're very yeah, they're like, a clear idea of what we think people would look like handsome in the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and Jeff Goldblum, who's not unattractive, but no. I think he's a bit more of that. You know, when you go when you look at the way Irving describes Ichabod, I think Jeff Goldblum kind of fits that more than the others do. Yeah, a little a little odder. <laughs> yeah, wide eyed, the big nose, really tall. Because Johnny Depp is like. Super short. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, Jeff Goldblum, I think, is probably a, probably one of the better, like, cast Ichabod. Well, because he's cute, too, so you can see why Katrina would be interested in him. What threw me off about the Disney version as I got older, especially, was just, like, Katrina would not be into this guy. Like, he's so yeah. wacky. He's so yeah. top, nerdy and just annoying. And you're just, like, it, they sort of hyper fixated on those the details the satir the satirical details of him you know <laughs> yeah so he's a little too like okay like i don't think katrina's blind but he's it's a little disney goofy is hot. like disney katrina is like ooh, look at you blonde hair blue eyes yeah. <laughs> well she's actually um she is cinderella so they use the yeah. same model sheets and stuff when they're working on Cinderella. So Katrina is Cinderella. Yes. Um, with a little sort of Disney so trivia cool. tidbit oh and God. stuff. I yeah. love that detail. Thank you. Um, um, amazing. All right. Well, I have another one here uh, from Emmeline. And she says, hi, Luce and Clark. I want to share this wonderful Sleepy Hollow creative couple with you and the Lanterns for Sleepy Hollow Month. This couple has a lovely 1920s cottage next to a historic cemetery in Sleepy Hollow, and they share all of the beauty and coziness and spookiness of their home and the area all year round. The husband is a professional pumpkin carver. I love the idea of the real, of, uh, excuse me. I love the idea of learning about the real town through them before getting into the novella. I would love to know if you or Clark have details on the history of how Sleepy Hollow got its name in real life. Thanks for all you do, Emmeline. And so um, I should have sent this to you beforehand, but I'll send it to you after. But there's a whole YouTube channel of this couple and their lives in Sleepy Hollow. Have you uh, heard of this at all? I probably haven't uh, heard of them. But there is actually like three or four people now that all live in Sleepy Hollow. I follow them on Instagram. That town seems to just attract spooky people now. Um, yeah. The, the YouTube is called It's a Charming Life. And they, Lindsay and Jonas, tea lovers, storytellers, living in a cozy cottage in the Sleepy Hollow countryside. And so they kind of, you know, their lifestyles, maybe like kind of cottage core lifestyle people and all of their videos oh, are yeah. about living in Sleepy Hollow. Let me, I'm actually bringing my Instagram up because I want to shout out the, the Sleepy Hollow people. Oh yeah, please. Um, I know people would love to hear about like your favorite, if there's good you know, Instagram follows or YouTube follows. And I'm going to send you the YouTube link. Um, I'm going to DM it to you so that you have it now. But oh, awesome. I'll, put, Thank you. 
For sure. I'll put this in the show notes so that everybody can watch it. The video on YouTube is Visit Sleepy Hollow, New York, a real Halloween town tour. And again, this couple, their YouTube is called It's a Charming Life. So it looks really fun, especially to just kind of see what Sleepy Hollow looks like all year round, not just during the fall, because I think, you know, people think about Salem and Sleepy Hollow and New Orleans, like all during the fall, but like living there all year round, it also gets like very hot in these places. Yeah. <laughs> Does it always look like uh, fall there? Yeah, it probably gets quite humid in the summer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Upstate I, New York? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I remember, so I was in Sleepy Hollow in 2003. Um, so that was kind of before like Halloween sort of erupted all over the place. Um, so it was very like Main Streety, like Disneyland. Oh, you sure, know, yeah. Old New Americana. England, small town. Um, but I remember the cemetery being really kind of creepy because it was so big. And we had actually, we went in the fall, like September, I think, and it rained on us the whole drive there. And then once we got there, the rain stopped, but the mist stayed. So we're walking through Sleepy Hollow Cemetery and it's almost like a horror film where the mist is like coming around like bends and the roads go off into nothing. That's Um, amazing. So it was super creepy. Um, All those old, like super ornate tombstones and mausoleums everywhere. Uh, But I'd love to go back now that Halloween has kind of like taken over and For see sure. kind of what it's like because they didn't do any of that stuff back then like the the pumpkin nights or the jack-o'-lantern blaze um you saw kind of like headless horseman um kind of stuff a little bit here and there um but not nearly as uh intense as it is now um and it is fun to follow like those sleepy hollow instagrammers and see kind of like their um their love of Halloween and then also like just Sleepy Hollow as like a sort of Americana small town is really fun too. Yeah, definitely. To me, a lot of the places in New England, the reason I love New England so much is because there's history everywhere. Like so many things from that you grow up reading about and it's just like, oh, it looks exactly like that. Like they don't change the architecture as much there as they do in other parts of the country because obviously history is everywhere. But to actually, you know, go to Salem and go to Sleepy Hollow and see things that were built in the 1600s, 1700s, it's incredible. Yeah, there's, I was actually, I love uh, Massachusetts. My family's from Lowell and I've gone back a couple of oh, times. Cool. Uh, and I was just recently in uh, Boston and Salem in 2018, uh, the week before That's Halloween. Right. In Salem for, that was the first time I ever went to Salem was in 2018, but it was the first week of November, right after Halloween. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, we just missed each other like by like two weeks. That's um, wild. I love that. I, I love that place so much. Um, but you're right. Like you walk down some of those neighborhoods, like by where like the House of the Seven Gables is. And oh. they put like when the house was built on those plaques yes. and you're like, this little house is from 1694 and like, it's still there and people live in it. And it's just so crazy to like see that. Cause we're, I think we're so used to um, track homes in yes. neighborhoods like that out here in Southern California. Um, but to walk into a place where you're like, Oh yeah, that same family's been living there for like, 300 years or something. Yeah. Like, generations. I was like it. going yeah. around and just putting my hand on like just the side of homes and being like history. I'm touching yeah. history. <laughs> I'm not a creep. I'm not it. being weird. I just need to touch a little yeah. history. <laughs> um, but yeah, you like, you feel it. Like when you're in Boston and you're kind of like by the old state house and stuff like that with those little brick buildings and you're like, yeah, that's mm. the same brick building that like, Sam Adams sat on <laughs> that bench and stuff or those stairs. Um, so it's wild to kind of be around all that. Absolutely. And I've still never been to Sleepy Hollow myself. So that's a big Halloween bucket list trip for me. And I honestly, one of my favorite, I'm going to manifest it as we do in Southern California by speaking it into the universe, but I want to host a live. <laughs> it's always Halloween there. 
Like it would be so fun. Wow. That would be wonderful. Um, yeah, I can't. I get get so jealous of these people that live there. I can't imagine sort of being able to like do a podcast live in that space and stuff. Would be well, just wonderful. listen, if I get the opportunity, Clark, you have to come with me. You have to be one of my special yes. guests. <laughs> Let's vacation, put it out there. spooky vacation. <laughs> For sure. So do you know the history of how it got its name or any background before even Washington Irving put it on the map? Oh, yeah. So it was just a little farming community. Technically, it was called Terrytown, which I think some people may oh. be familiar with or they've heard of it. Sleepy Hollow was ki- calling it Sleepy Hollow was kind of like uh, calling Anaheim Hills like its own city. Like it was part of Terrytown, but it was sort of its own little community. Okay. Um, but it was always founded as Terrytown. Um, or if you're familiar with Salem, you know, there was Salem Town and there was Salem Village. So there were two right. different kind of communities that were sort of the same. It was a little bit like that. Um, and it was a farming community first, and then it kind of got swept up into the, um, the textile kind of mill town um, factories and stuff sort of replaced agriculture. And then in sort of the eighties, maybe late seventies, eighties, when manufacturing started to be outsourced, the city kind of like was falling on hard times and they voted to separate from Terrytown and call themselves Sleepy Hollow because they wanted to replace like the factories with tourism. <laughs> so capitalize on the name and like Washington Irving and that's sort of where like Sleepy Hollow as its own independent like town comes from. Oh, interesting. All right, fantastic. I didn't know any of that. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, okay, well, let's move on. Oh, before we move on, do you want to share any of the Sleepy Hollow lifestyler people now if you have their names close by or should we, you could send them to me later and I can put them in the show notes. Um, I can send them to you. Okay, great. Well, Clark has a bunch of uh, recommendations for everybody. So <laughs> make sure to click on the show notes when you're done listening for all the good links. Uh, let's hit our last eek mail. This one has the subtitle or the uh, subject line, Disney Sleepy Hollow Trickery. Hello, Luce and Clark, and hello to all the lanterns out there dealing with post-paranormal depression that is the month of November. (laughs) As a child in Oregon, I was lucky enough to make two trips down to Disneyland, one at five years old and one at nine. Oh, perfect ages for Disney. Yeah, absolutely. On my second trip, I went to the infamous Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and was enamored with the anthropomorphic animals, the old-timey aesthetic, and, of course, the visit to hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Sure. Love it. <laughs> right. Sure, Star Tours and Thunder Mountain Railroad are great, but on the flight home, I kept thinking about Mr. Toad. What in the world was going on in there? <laughs> At the school library, I got a book about Disney movies and discovered that Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was from The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Looking at the pictures, I was confused. I had seen this. The wide world of Disney had played The Legend of Sleepy Hollow more than once a year. Why hadn't I seen Mr. Toad as well? As we were a family of modest means in the late 80s, I did not have the Disney Channel to help me out. The local video stores were no help either, and even the big box stores with hundreds of titles to choose from didn't help me out. The adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad remained locked up tight in the Disney vault. I still harbored a mild resentment for Ichabod and all things Sleepy Hollow for several years due to this quote-unquote injustice. (laughs) And I turned up my nose at the cartoon segments whenever I saw them included on clip shows or heard the song on the radio. Why should they see the light of day while Mr. Toad moldered in obscurity? (laughs) 
As a constant reader of the Red Wall book series, anthropomorphic creatures in pastoral settings would always be my bias. <laughs> Appropriately enough, the Disney Vault finally released the film on VHS in 1999, the same year that Tim Burton's Sleepy Hollow was released in theaters, thus allowing me to fully enjoy the new adaptation without any of my childhood outrage shaking its tiny little fist at the screen. Thanks again for everything you do with the podcast, Luce, and I hope you have a very happy feast on thanks <laughs> And that is from uh, Grim Turn Tom. Tom is uh, incredible help to the podcast. He's helping archive every single episode. So even this episode, he's going to make sure all the links are available about every single thing we talk about, which is awesome. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's one of the most incredible emails I've ever heard in my life. Right? So I didn't know that this was something that was unavailable for so long. I just, I remember watching Mr. Toad's, um, I was going to say Wild Ride, that's not the name of the movie, but like The Wind in the Willows, I watched that when I was a kid and I thought it was really scary. Yeah, it is kind of creepy. A lot of the old Disney stuff didn't really shy away from going spooky or sad, like with Bambi. Um, but, and I don't know, you know, for me growing up, we had, uh, Disney on VHS and some of them were films, but they really like, I think I said before, like, I didn't know that like melody time or make my music like existed because my VHS was bongo. It was, uh, Willie the whale who wanted to sing at the Met. Um, and so Legend of Sleepy Hollow and The Wind in the Willows were always like separate things. I don't know. Um, maybe that was they could make more money doing that than um, releasing Ichabod and Mr. Toad as one thing. Um, but I just know that there was that uh, like Disney thought that they could maybe split things up and sell more. But even like um, Salud's Amigos or Three Caballeros were all one thing. I think it was just those wartime package films that got diced up. Uh, so that's how I kind of always knew Sleepy Hollow was its own thing. Yeah, I know. It's something I've always sort of resented about Disney that they really just withhold a lot of things for like the best money-making uh, ability with some of their films. And I'm like, let the people have the art. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of what, um, I think it was just recently that like Black Cauldron went on Blu-ray or something. Like they really hold on to stuff until the most commercially opportune moment. Yes, it's um, really frustrating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I can, I, someone has, I've heard rumors that there is a Sleepy Hollow Easter egg and Mr. Toad's wild ride, but I don't think I've ever seen it. Oh, um, I don't know about that either. I've heard like something like Ichabod or the Horseman or something is in there somewhere, but I've never, I've never seen it. Oh, all um, right, Lanterns. If you know about the Easter egg in uh, the Mr. Toad story, let us know. Call in, write in. We want to hear about it. Go straight to um, Digiland and find it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I loved Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. I went on it last year and it was the first time that I wrote it since I was three. And when I wrote it when I was three with my dad, I was so scared. I started crying and he had to like shield me and sing uh, Old MacDonald to calm me down. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know that was um, I worked at Disneyland for a while and that one and uh, Snow White before they changed it was yep. always like he was just crying kids one after another coming out those exits um yeah which is kind I of why people sort of don't understand why peter pan always has such a long line it's because it's one of the least terrifying dark rides yes yes and they really do sort of harken back to the old haunted attraction dark rides at fairgrounds you know they feel really similar to that uh which is why i really like those rides the best at disney yeah I know they still, I mean, there's still some spookiness with the Snow White one, um, but it's not nearly as uh, terrifying as it used to be. 
which is no. sad. <laughs> it is sad. <laughs> Um, well, I want to thank all of the lanterns who wrote in Emmeline, Tom, Diego, Ashley. These are fantastic memories and stories. And I had like such a blast talking about them with you, Clark. Oh, me too. Those I love hearing from people. Um, and I'm so happy that like you said earlier that some of the lanterns, uh, went to go see the show. I mean, that's, you know, I never kind of expected that I would be in a position of doing things like these. Um, and so just, you know, seeing the people that came in and hearing the responses to the show is always sort of, um, heartwarming and sort of, uh, unbelievable at times, but I'm glad that the lanterns, uh, who got to see it, uh, enjoyed it. Uh, yes, same. And I want to thank all the lanterns who told me about it. Um, especially Lighthouse Ghost, I believe is the patron, one of the, uh, ghoul gang members on our Patreon who told me that you still had copies of the book available. And that's when I originally reached out at you and we started connecting. So I'm really happy that um, really the ghoul gang and the lanterns brought us together. So I'm really yeah. lucky to know you. I'm really happy that we got to have this conversation and now you're a lantern and we got to sort of meet at Midsummer Scream. It's just been a really fun to connect with you over Halloween. Oh yeah, same here. I'm so happy when I sort of, um, we connected kind of on Instagram to see, you know, I've always loved like connecting with people who love Halloween um, and especially people who take kind of like the history uh, and love of research with it is always so exciting to sort of meet those people. Oh, amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And can you share anything that you're working on now or uh, any way that you want people to keep in touch with you or see your work anywhere specifically? Uh, how should people do that? Uh, you can follow me um, on Instagram. I'm art of Clark Silva. Uh, I do um, curation for Museo still. So we have the, uh, the Harry Houdini exhibition is up until January 22nd. Uh, and then I am, after that, I'm doing, uh, kind of like with Sleepy Hollow, uh, one of the new exhibits opening is on the, uh, queer and gay coding of American illustrator J.C. Leindecker. Oh, cool. Uh, and I have, um, I did some indie curation at the Hilbert Museum. So there's a totally unrelated, but it's a, a sports arts show from their collection. Um, that's up until December 3rd at the Hilbert in uh, downtown Orange. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Well, this episode is going to be out in a couple of days. So people will have time to see the December 3rd show if they rush right out as soon as they hear this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Amazing. Well, I will put links to all of that in our show notes and maybe we can do a fun, like SoCal lanterns trip to one of your shows. I'd love to see this Houdini show. He's fascinating as well because he had a lot of overlap with the American spiritual movement. Yeah, we, um, it's sort of a full blown kind of like retrospective of his whole life. Um, and it's really cool. And one of the uh, sections is on his kind of war with the spiritualist. That's, uh, my personal favorite section of the, of the exhibition. Um, so that's really fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, and his weird uh, sort of competitive uh, frenemy relationship with uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of uh, Sherlock Holmes, because he and his wife were like major spiritualists and like really believed in it. Yeah, they had like a, a big falling out when Houdini started to kind of go after the spiritualists. Um, not that I think people sort of are like, oh, Houdini was anti-spiritualist. And he not, not necessarily was. He was more like, I need to go after like the charlatans. Yes. And the fakers because they're exploiting this for money. And he was more against that than like spiritualism itself. I think he really wanted spiritualism to be real. Like, I think he was yeah. fascinated by it. Yeah, and he really, like, he was very close with his mom, and he wanted to try to connect with her. And when he found out that some of these spiritualists were fakers, I think that sort of set him off uh, Absolutely. that war path to take them down. 
Absolutely. As it would, you know, because you're playing on people's emotions in their most vulnerable time. So it's interesting because uh, he was such an incredible illusionist. So I think he, there had to have been an aspect of him admiring the illusions that spiritualist people used to conjure the idea of ghosts in the room, but just using it in this sort of way to hoodwink people, you know, Houdini was very clear about his work being illusions. And I, I think he must have hated yeah. when people tried to pretend their illusions were real. Yeah. He, Houdini was someone who could definitely hold a grudge. And if he felt that <laughs> he or other people were being wronged, uh, he wouldn't, he would not stop until he kind of brought you down. Um, I admire so that. They, Seems like a ride or die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely yeah houdini is your ride or die pretty much yeah just don't don't piss them off yeah yeah if you need to change the name of the show halfway through houdini your ride or die i you can use that for your show <laughs> yeah oh yeah <laughs> Lovely next exhibition name ride or die houdini <laughs> Well, Clark, it really was such a joy having you on the show and hearing just your breadth of knowledge with Washington Irving and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is just bar none. And I'm just very grateful that you took some time to share all of that with us today. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was such an incredible treat. Um, I love talking about this and with anybody that will listen. Um, <laughs> and I'm such an admirer of your podcast <laughs> that okay. I was like, when you asked me, I was like, oh, of course I have to, I have to do this. Yes. So thank well, you so much. You are welcome. And uh, thank you for being a fan of the podcast. I would love to do something uh, together again. Maybe we can brainstorm a live episode in Los Angeles. Uh, something fun. Ooh. Yes, that would be fantastic. I'm down. Okay, great. Well, keep in touch. And if you ever want to curate anything Halloween related, I will uh, gladly help you out with that. <laughs> Ooh, yes. There actually might. I won't say anything now because I don't want to jinx anything. But next year, there's some there's some fun stuff coming. Ooh, all right. Well, uh, you know my so number. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, amazing. Well, have a terrific rest of November. This feels like Halloween Junior to me because getting to see it finally get cold in LA. I'm like, yes, it's Halloween weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we finally get the fall weather that we wanted two months ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. During hot Halloween. <laughs> 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 yes, enjoy the rest of this fall season and creepy Christmas uh, and stay in touch. We'd love to have you back. Oh, absolutely. I would love to do that, too. That was such a fun conversation with Clark. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. And I really do hope the universe hears us and that we could do a live show together one day. I think that would be a total hoot. So if you have any Halloween memories, anything related to the legend of Sleepy Hollow, to Washington Irving, we would love to hear them. Give us a call at 802 532 dead or write us that eek mail at it's always Halloween podcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram at it's always Halloween podcast and help us produce the show by logging in to Patreon, patreon.com slash it's always Halloween. You can support us for as little as a dollar a month. That's $10 a year or for as much as $16 a month. That's $160 a year and you get tons of fun bonuses plus just the knowledge, that creepy, oozy, gooey knowledge of knowing that you're contributing directly to interviews like this and the expansion of the podcast. So thank you so much to our Patreon ghoul gang who helps us with every episode. This episode was uh, researched by me, your forever haunted host, Luce Tomlin Brenner, with help from our incredible guest, Clark Silva. You can find Clark at Art of Clark Silva on Instagram. And I will put all the other links to his work and his upcoming shows in the show notes. The editing, sound design, and theme music is by the wonderful Pete Burns. Thanks, Pete. And we could not have done today's episode without the contributions from your lovely fellow lanterns, 
Ashley, Diego, Emmeline, and Grimturn Tom. Thanks so much, Lanterns. And thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of It's Always Halloween. Make sure to come back next time, unless you fall for a Dutch prank. Thank you.